Hello, and welcome to the Lake Superior Quinn Tobacco is Sacred Native American Ceremonial versus Commercial Tobacco Use Webinar. My name is Michelle, and I will be your operator for today's call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. And during the question and answer session, if you have a question, please press star, then one on your touchtone phone. I will now turn the call over to Ms. Jerry Henniker. Ma'am, you may begin. Thank you. And welcome, everyone, to today's Lake Superior Quinn webinar. So Lake Superior Quinn is made up of the states of Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. And again, I'm Jerry Henniker with um, the Minnesota QIO, which is Stratus Health. And we will be hearing today from Chris Rhodes. Um, Chris Rhodes earned a Master's of Public Health degree in Public Health Administration and Policy and a Bachelor of Science degree in Community Health Education, both from the University of Minnesota. Her professional work has focused on improving the health of American Indian health communities and always with community-led focus. She is a nationally recognized expert in American Indian tobacco control with more than two decades of experience. She has developed tribal and urban health programs and resources with a strong focus on evaluation and research in order to develop an evidence base that works in Native American communities. She is currently the CEO of the American Indian Cancer Foundation and a national organization that is dedicated to eliminating cancer burdens for American Indians. And in this role, Chris has developed this organization from the ground up and developed its, necessity, its necessary capacity to address the broad spectrum of cancer issues among tribal communities. Um, we will be taking questions for Chris after the presentation today, so if you can maybe drop those questions down, or you can share your questions via chat throughout the presentation. Um, as, at that time, we'll open up the lines, um, for, and if you can just take them off mute when you ask your question. Um, the operator will also share with you how to do that again at the end of the um, presentation today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Chris, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Jerry. Um, good morning, um, virtual folks um, across the Great Lakes region. Um, happy to join you here today. Um, to talk about tobacco and what that uh, what that tobacco means um, to me as a Native woman and to my community um, and um, potentially to uh, patients that are served um, within the health systems that you work in. Okay. So everyone on the call today knows that there's nothing more harmful to my health than tobacco. Uh, what I want you to know today is that for me as a Native woman, there's nothing more important to my health and well-being than tobacco. Tobacco is a medicine that my people have always used as part of ceremony and prayer on a regular basis. This tobacco use looks different than what you may be used to and certainly what we see um, portrayed um, on street corners and by doorways and um, et cetera. So I'm going to share with you and take you through and um, share some information about what tobacco, sacred tobacco use actually means. One of my teachings um, from one of my elders, um, I really liked the way um, she talked about tobacco, and she said, um, just like any other medicine, when it is used correctly, it has the power to bring good things to our life. And when it's not used correctly, it has the power to bring great harm. And I think tobacco um, is such a good example of this, but really we can think of just about any medicinal product that we use um, when it's misused um, in ways that it wasn't intended, it becomes very dangerous. And I think that's um, very true of tobacco. And so 
we have to be really clear about the teaching behind how this tobacco use is intended. Um, it is, um, again, very different than what we, um, when we're talking about commercial tobacco use. Um, and when I say commercial tobacco use, I'm talking about the tobacco that you buy in a store. Um, it can come in the form of cigarettes or chewing tobacco. Um, it could be uh, loose tobacco. And in recent days, recent years, um, we see vape and other manufactured products um, delivering nicotine um, that may or may not contain actual tobacco. Traditional tobacco is usually not bought in a store, first of all. Um, we call it Indian tobacco. We also, each tribe has a name for tobacco. For the Anishinaabe people, which um, are most of the tribes in the Great Lakes region, we refer to tobacco as a sema. And um, for Dakota communities, um, the word is shanshasha. Um, we also, both Dakota and Anishinaabe Ojibwe communities, use a mixture that's called referred to as kinikinik, and this mixture likely doesn't, mostly doesn't contain any tobacco. Um, it's really made up of the shavings of the red willow bark, um, but we still refer to it and use it like tobacco. And so um, it can be a little um, compli complicated to figure out exactly um, what's being used and how it's being used. Um, the um, pictures on this slide, the first three on the left are the traditional tobacco plants um, that are grown in this region. Um, the, the baby seedling to the full flowering plant and then the tobacco drying on the fence post there. Um, the middle picture is um, an example of what you might see in most Native people's homes um, where the tobacco um, is available for people um, that want to use it for prayer um, or ceremony. Um, it's usually available in that kind of form or um, in a pouch. The pictures on the right are the red willow bark um, that I shared. Um, there definitely are protocols for both of these kinds of tobacco protocols for how we grow, gather, and um, produce this tobacco and how we share it. Um, it um, it's not something, um, again, it's a sacred medicine, and um, we have to do it in the right way in order to, for it to be um, used in a good way. Um, I do want to, you know, unfortunately, the inability to practice our culture and use our sacred tobacco has led to unhealthy ways of using commercial tobacco. Um, that commercial tobacco has made its way into our ceremonies. Um, it was a way to hide in plain sight um, when um, American Indian religious um, freedom did not exist. Um, so, and of course, once this um, very addictive commercial tobacco is introduced and is available on a daily basis. Um, unfortunately, it, it has made its way in um, to great, uh, great deal of, of addiction, um, tobacco addiction, nicotine addiction in our communities. And again, I will repeat that the use for spiritual reasons is very different than um, or recreational use. For, um, I use tobacco on a daily basis, and I don't ever burn or inhale it. Um, my tobacco is placed on the ground as an offering in the morning. Um, it can also be placed in water or by a fire. Another common use is for me to wrap some tobacco in a cloth and give that tobacco to uh, a person, an elder that I'm seeking guidance from. That's an expected 
um, exchange that would happen. Um, kind of thing. And then, of course, there is the ceremonial type that is used um, in certain ceremonies and by certain people. Um, but in um, Ojibwe uh, communities, it's not as common as the other ways I've just explained. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the American Indian Cancer Foundation. Um, as you may not have known about us, we are a quite young organization, a 501c3 national nonprofit um, that was established in 2011. And we're based in Minneapolis, but we serve um, tribal, all 567 tribal communities across the U.S. Our vision is a world where cancer is no longer a huge burden for our family. And we believe this is possible through hard work, culturally appropriate, community-based programs, and policy change that affords Native people access to the best prevention and treatment strategies. Our approach at the American Indian Cancer Foundation is that we recognize we have been where we have been and how history has complicated our ability to thrive. And we believe that Native communities have the wisdom to find the solutions to any health inequities um, that they are seeking. Um, often also seeking the organizational capacity, expert input, and resources to do so. And so we work with a lot of tribal communities, um, with the health systems, and with the, um, across the communities to build um, healthier cancer prevention um, and access to care. Um, policies really for sustainable change. Of course, when we're looking at any health issue, we need to start with data, and numbers always <laughs> inform the work that we do. I know this is your reality as well. Um, unfortunately, it's been a struggle um, across Indian country to get good data because of small sample sizes. Um, issues like racial misclassification. Um, and so the two reports that are shown on this slide really are the best data output that we have. And it's been a while now since um, they've come out. So we're really pushing for more data to really show um, what's happening and where we're making progress. But these reports really were the first to bring to light that um, cancer incidence and mortality rates vary by tribe and region and gender, but are alarmingly higher than non-Hispanic whites even in the same region. Over two decades, um, substantial progress has been achieved in reducing cancer mortality among the U.S. population, and um, unfortunately, we haven't seen that with American and Alaska Native populations. Our mortality rates are still increasing. In part, we know that behind this are the really high smoking rates and the tobacco addiction. This chart shows U.S. smoking rates by gender from 1965 to 2011. And for those of us on the call that were around in the 60s and 70s, it seemed as if everyone around us smoked. There were ashtrays and smoke everywhere, in offices, malls, airplanes, even um, hospitals. Um, the smoking rate was really high, but when we look at this chart, we can see that the smoking rate is nowhere close to the 59% smoking rate that we see among American Indians in Minnesota today. And this is at a time when we see the lowest smoking rates among the overall population. 
and yet some groups are still smoking at extraordinarily high rates, makes us stop and ask why, and why haven't the strategies that have worked with this huge decline worked for all populations? What's different here, and what can we do to see these same decreases for American Indians and Alaska Natives? We use this um, image. Again, we see um, nationally the American Indian and Alaska Native smoking rate is about 30%, but what it really does is it maps the variation by region. The highest rates are in the Northern Plains, which includes the Great Lakes region, which is, shows up as gold on this map, um, where smoking rates um, are in the Dakotas have um, been shown to be in the 70% 70, 70 we've seen. Um, and then we see the lowest rates that with American Indians in the Southwest, where the tribal people in um, those areas have smoking rates that are even lower than the mainstream population in that region. So it's really important that we have this local data to be able to tell what's happening and to be able to move the needle in um, changing the tobacco addiction rate. This slide um, is the data from the tribal tobacco prevalence study, that top line, uh, the top bar, um, and it shows in comparison at the same time um, the Minnesota, All tobacco, or Minnesota Adult Tobacco Survey rate, and we can see the um, extreme differences in every single, um, whether we're talking about the really low percentage of never smokers among American Indian adults or the really high rate of current smokers, that's four times the rate um, American Indians are smoking cigarettes at than um, the all Minnesota population. And that middle part, the gray bar, the former smokers, really show um, that we really haven't done enough in American Indian communities to get that quit rate, um, to increase the quit rate among this population. It, um, <clears throat> that's an area where we are uh, need to work on improvements. And again, this this chart should be um, stirring up all kinds of questions about why is this rate so different and what can be done about this. And I want to share some. Um, just some really highlight, highlights of why these are, um, such a, why tobacco is such a complex issue to address for American Indian communities. Um, over seven years, <laughs> generations of federal policies that have tried to terminate um, the unique legal and political relationships between tribes, um, as well as to eliminate Native people all together, um, and that um, result of that historical trauma um, of the boarding schools um, and the loss of culture is one of the pieces. I spoke earlier about the lack of religious freedom. Um, the American Indian Religious Freedom Act passed in 1978. Before that time, it would be legal for American Indian people to practice um, ceremonies, and as I shared earlier, tobacco is a part of every single ceremony. The other, I talked a little bit about the cultural norms where commercial tobacco use has then become part of our cultural practice and ceremonies. Um, I think mainly out of convenience, it's easier to go to the store and get that tobacco. And um, I started out by talking about the historical trauma and the current issues in trauma. And um, we see this playing out in the news on a regular basis with, I know, just recently in our region, um, in my home community at the Bad River Reservation, a 13-year-old young man was 
uh, murdered by the police and last week. And that trauma in that community, I did no plays into this. And that wasn't, that's not the first time it's, um, it happens. The racism is there. And it makes, um, everything really challenging in our communities. Uh, there's work to do. Tribal, tribal economic issues are also a part of this issue. Tobacco sales have been an important part of the tribal economy. And, of course, with casinos, um, it is complicated because of the smoking um, policies uh, or the lack of smokery policies in casinos. And that's something that many public health professionals are working on across the board. Cultural identity plays into it with um, imagery of um, our people on tobacco products. And again, the social norms, when more people around you smoke than don't, it makes it really hard to quit and stay quit. So um, these are big issues and um, can be paralyzing to us at times when we talk about, wow, how are we going to get a handle on um, dealing with tobacco addiction. And um, really, we, we really need to remember that these high rates of tobacco addiction, tobacco can be used as a way to self-medicate and really as a symptom for some of these larger, deeper issues um, happening in our communities. As I mentioned, the American Indian Religious Freedom Act passed in 1978, so commercial tobacco became part of our ceremony. Commercial tobacco is still very much a part of our ceremony. It's something that a lot of um, tribally led tobacco efforts are um, working to change there, um, but it has to be um, removing commercial tobacco and replacing it with traditional tobacco, of course, has to happen from within the community. It's not something that's going to happen um, from outside the community, but there are changes. We're seeing um, spiritual leaders that are now only accepting traditional tobacco use, that really just going back to that old way. And um, we're seeing um, some powerhouse that will not um, accept the use of commercial tobacco at the drum, um, but it's um, relatively slow and changing. But it's moving. I mentioned before that um, commercial tobacco um, has been marketed with American Indian imagery. It may seem that these are all American Indian produced products, and for the most part, they are not. I believe out of this picture, the Omaha brand is the only. Um, actual tribal um, tobacco product um, where otherwise they are um, companies that are using American Indian names and images to try to promote the project, the product based on stereotypes. And of course, we have this imagery and we have the tobacco in our communities. Again, it's tied to our, it becomes tied to our young people's identity um, and our adults. Um, but the young people get lured in, and nicotine addiction is powerful. And the smoking, um, and then that behavior is modeled and to the next generation, and it makes it really difficult to quit. So some of the strategies we're using is really thinking about how to impact social norms, um, how to support that almost 50% of the po adult population that is not smoking, um, and to make it start making it easier to quit and stay quit. Um, one of the findings of the Minnesota Tribal Tobacco Use Prevalence Study was that our smoking rate was highest among 25 to 44-year-olds. Um, up around 70 percent 
go. Um, and we're really troubled by that because, of course, these are um, the ages of parents that would be modeling the smoking behavior to the children. And so we really wanted to address um, this issue and support. And so we're working to change social norms um, through campaigns, um, one hashtag at a time, kind of, like, um, but really thinking about how do we, um, making sure that they're native of lead and that native values are woven in, um, in this image, of course, um, it's, it's really important that, um, the mom is, sm that she's, the woman here is smoke free for her child. That's, um, definitely a cultural value. It's, um, and then the fact that um, the proud, the pride um, speaks loud and clear in this image. Those are some ways that um, the community has really responded to and is really excited about um, sharing and being a part of and seeing themselves as part of that. Another way that um, we engage community across the U.S on um, social media is uh, a quick connection is a Facebook support group for American Indians and Alaska Natives. Um, again, it's not a quick, it's not a cessation program, but it provides some peer-to-peer -peer support. And it really is about um, reaching, effectively really creating accessibility and engagement opportunities for Native people um, that are off, that are living in isolated communities. It's a way to find people that are other people that are interested in quitting smoking, and um, that support that you need to keep going. It's um, what we post in there is are, we include culturally tailored resources and messaging that is specific to Native people um, who have quit or are thinking about quitting, and it's been um, something that people have really engaged in. We also include, like, prizes for engagement, things, the indigenous food gift baskets, um, and um, T-shirts that are connected, and again, are connected to that um, I quit message and being proud of that. Another part of the work is um, how I met here that's focused on clinic systems. Um, for the last two and a half years, we've um, done this project called I Quit. Um, it's been funded by Clearway, Minnesota as a research project. It's a feasibility study to see um, if these approaches, these systems change approaches, can um, increase quit rate. Um, so we prov we go um, into the clinic and work with them to support, to develop an interdepartmental team, um, and then we provide training and really a focus on the five A's model. Um, we provide training. We work on customized tools, so we have culturally appropriate tools. But then clinics need customized tools on what their actual so the clinic flow would look like when it comes to cessation and um, treatment. Um, and um, there's another customized tool around which cessation medications um, and MRT are available. The interdepartmental team sets the quality improvement goals and implements system changes. Um, and they really determine that. and. They move forward fast and furious, and sometimes it's a little slow, and um, like you all know how that works. <laughs> um, really focused on the medical record, data monitoring, and um, again, it's built on the five A's. Of course, these clinics are all different. They have different staffing. They have different population si sizes. Um, different services available, and they all work with different EMR or EHR platforms, um, which has made providing the support 
from a distance a little challenging, but we've seen some great successes across the board. We've seen increases in um, EHR documentation of the five A's. Um, most of the clinics were not even documenting it two and a half years ago, and now they've um, improved and revised how they're documenting EHR. Um, we've seen increased engagement across the health system of um, more peop more employees seeing um, the five A's as part of their role. Um, everybody from the receptionist to the dentist to the um, um, clinician have a role when it comes to encouraging um, um, asking about tobacco use. We've seen um, clinics add standing orders um, for um, cessation medication or NRT. We can increase use of um, pharmacotherapy, including um, NRT, and um, more billing codes um, being used to um, help support um, the sustainability of addressing tobacco cessation. Um, and, and then finally, improvements in the referral and cessation system flows, really working through that. Um, I think we could learn even more from engaging um, the LSQIN in this. Um, so challenges and finding challenges have really been um, the staff turnover or in getting leadership to support a clinic champion to um, lead this, pro this um, process. This is an example of one of the resources that was created for this program. It really, again, the, the put attempts are really low for American Indians generally in these clinics, and the use of uh, pharmacotherapy was even lower. And so we're, you know, obviously people are they're trying to quit on their own and they're not using any kind of support um, to chance every, and everybody around is smoking. Um, it makes it a really hard process. So we really were focused on in, um, increasing the use of counseling and pharmacotherapy. Um, this resource is also used, shared on social media and reaching folks other ways. And we also had worked with a tribe in New York State to translate this infographic into their tribal language um, as a way to reach more of the elders that were um, interested in it, as well as a way to engage um, younger adult smokers to let them know that the elders felt it was okay to use medications in an RT. Sometimes there's some myths around um, use of medicine and um, whether or not um, that's an okay thing to do as a Native person. And so this is part of that, changing that story. And speaking, I didn't realize that was the title of the next. So changing the story, um, we really focus on just recognizing that health, according to the WHO, um, is really reflective of how Native people see health, that um, it's not just about um, feeling good physically, it's a state of complete physical, social, and mental well-being. Um, and when we talk about health equity, sometimes there's, um, there is confusion about what that might mean, and it really is, I, we would like this definition that came out of the 2014 um, Advancing Health Equity Report out of the Minnesota Department of Health. It's where all people have the opportunity to realize their highest potential of health possible. Um, and when we look at what impacts our health, we can see that clinical care um, really only accounts for about 10% of a person's overall health and that we really have to pay attention to everything else that's going on around us, um, including our um, health behaviors and really the social and economic factors that make up um, what we call social determinants of health. And that 40% is really determined, determined 
that things like transportation and safety and education and housing and access to healthy foods, um, it means that um, these major systems um, that we interact with daily set us and our children up for success or failure, um, health or disease, long life or premature mortality. And so we really have to pay attention to the fact that um, all of this does impact um, American Indian um, health and spirituality and tobacco use. Even when it seems it's so far removed, um, it is um, very much connected. And a lot of the way we do the work is around um, focusing on um, policy systems and environmental change, um, and that maybe we drank the Kuwait a little bit at some health departments um, with CDC and um, the state health department. We really focus on the sustainable changes. Um, and then when we talk to our elders, we are like, how are we going to translate this to our communities? And um, one of the elders, um, John Poupart, shared, he says, these, these are not foreign to our ways as indigenous people. In fact, we've always had policies, if we think about them as our guiding principles for ways of living, and we always have had these systems in our communities, whether they're our, plan, our family, our clan, and our food system, or environmental, where we're talking about seasonal practices for harvesting foods, medicines, and taking care of earth and all, all of its inhabitants. And so um, that is much more palatable when we're working with tribal communities and we're talking about um, policy systems and environmental changes. We're, we're talking about these old ways and we're talking about the new ways in which we live. And all of us as Native people were, live in, um, in both in these dual environments on a regular, every um, doing a little bit weird. It feels like I'm sitting here talking to myself, but, um, <laughs> I know you're all are listening. Um, we're ready to move on. So, the, um, so the, the way the policy systems environmental change work um, plays out um, in a tribal community. This is an example of um, an infographic that we've developed and work with tribal communities on improving, um, um, so to changing the way tobacco is used and really protecting the sacred use and rejecting the harmful use of tobacco. And we can do that by, by implementing PSC changes throughout the community. It doesn't have to be all focused on um, the clinic system. The clinic system is an important part of it, but it has to include these other players in order for it to be effective and in order for us to um, reduce that um, tobacco addiction rate to one that's much lower and to, ret again, return to that um, way of protecting tobacco as our sacred medicine. And so I you know, zoomed in here and you can see that there are opportunities whether we're talking about at the tribal retail or convenience store where we could um, develop and pass policies that could um, limit marketing or use access or um, impact the way flavored tobacco or e-cigarettes are um, sold available. We also are um, see tribal communities that are implementing policies and changes in those ways tobacco is being used um, within their ceremonial dance room. And of course, within the tribal clinics, we um, see and we, we're seeing new ways all the time that health systems are improving the way cessation support is available um, to people who are addicted to nicotine. So how can you help us build stronger communities? Um, 
Hopefully, at this point, you've seen the data and you agree that this is a public health crisis that has not had enough attention in our communities. These nicotine addiction rates in tribal communities are um, unbelievably high, um, and we have a lot of work to do and no time to waste. Um, we need partners who are ready to support this work and to trust the communities to lead the way. That's how we do the work at the American Indian Cancer Foundation. I'm really supporting the communities to, again, guide those, lead the solutions. I wanted to highlight some of the work that you may not know have seen um, that has been done by some of our partners. This is an example of a partner that Quit Plan or Clearly Minnesota. Um, they have developed some, a media campaign um, that has been tribally led. Um, it's, they have invested in this media strategy as a solution, and the campaign has been shared statewide on both boards and mass transit, and again, it's been based on years of listening and involvement with American Indian communities. Another campaign um, that happened, this was in Minneapolis, um, this huge building, I don't think, I had a picture with a person standing in there. I think it's there's a person standing in there, but about as tall as that brown bison there. So it's a huge mural on the side of the Minneapolis American Indian Center. Um, the community um, designed and um, commissioned this beautiful mural, and it speaks volumes and will be around for years to come. Another example of our partner's work is written in this um, research article that was published in the American Journal of Public Health in 2016. Um, the article is a great resource if you want to go deeper on this topic of what does it mean, what does trad traditional tobacco control mean, and um, you can find it on PubMed, or if you email me, I can certainly send you a copy. If you are less interested in the journal article and would be more likely to watch a Emmy-winning documentary, this is probably the resource for you. Um, Reclaiming Sacred Tobacco is a 30-minute documentary that was produced by TPT, um, which is the public um, PBS station in the Twin Cities. And you can find this documentary on the Kohler Minnesota website. It is it truly is a great resource. Finally, I invite you to keep in touch with us. Reach out if you have questions, certainly um, if you want more information or want to be more connected to how we're getting information out to um, travel and urban communities. Um, you can follow us on social media. Um, and so that's the end of my talking, and now I'm excited to have some time to hear your questions and um, respond to any issues that you might want to. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. That was a great presentation. Um, and Michelle, if you could remind everyone how to get in the queue to ask a question. Yes, ma'am. If you have a question at this time, please press star, then one on your touchtone phone. If you wish to be removed from the queue, please press the pound sign or the hash key. There will be a slight delay before the first question is announced. And if you're using a speaker phone, you may need to pick up on your handset first before pressing the numbers. Once again, to ask a question, please press star, then one on your touchtone phone. We are standing by for questions now. Okay. 
At this time, ma'am, I have no questions in the queue. Thank you. Um, and I just realized I was talking myself and had my phone on mute. Um, <laughs> so I was just going to say, we didn't have any questions in, in chat, but we did um, have some information shared by Tamara that they're using a phone app. Um, and it's very, um, it works very well for their practice. They um, are by Hayward, Wisconsin. And, and so um, the information today was also very relevant. Um, one question that did just come up from um, Jess is what ways have you seen implemented to support or celebrate non-smokers in your communities? Mm -hmm. I think um, really it has been those ways of just celebrating um, there was the I am a smoke-free mom, um, the I quit t-shirts. I think um, there have been smoke-free challenges, certainly in communities um, that celebrate people that have been smoke-free. Um, I think those are, those are some of the examples that I can think of. You need more. <laughs> That is a great question, Jess, and I did just ask that in chat, too, if there, anyone else has any examples of what they're using in their community for celebration. I think I'd be, I'd, we'd love to hear about it. Um, and any, I'm, are there any other questions that have come through on the phone at this time? No, ma'am. I have no questions in the queue. Okay. One of the things I was wondering, Chris, um, and I, I know you asked the question too during your presentation, but I did find it really interesting, um, the difference between the Great Lakes states um, in their um, tobacco use, their commercial tobacco use, versus what we saw in the Southwest. And if there's, are, are there any studies or any other data that might um, be relevant as to why there is that great difference, anything that we're aware of, or if anyone on the phone has any answers? The one difference that we know of is that um, down in the Southwest, their um, sacred item that they pray with is corn and not tobacco. And um, so tobacco doesn't have that same, hasn't had that same integration into um, communities, and therefore the commercial tobacco ha doesn't have that same um, integration into ceremonies. Oh. Okay. That, that so, but it's, just, it's complex. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes a lot of sense. We did just get a couple more questions in chat. Um, Randy was wondering, um, First, great presentation, Chris. Um, and then also, you mentioned that there's a lack of access to tra tra traditional tobacco, and that that's part of the concern. Um, have you heard of any efforts to make it more available for, for ceremonial use and to move away from the reliance on commercial tobacco? Absolutely. There are several tribal communities that are um, really revitalizing this traditional the access to traditional tobacco, um, both in growing tobacco and um, using those ancient um, seeds as a way to um, make that happen, as well as a lot of um, teaching around harvesting that red willow for the picnic. Um, again, there's special ways and special times of the year when you can do each of those, and so there definitely are teaching happening, um, and those efforts have been supported um, by Clearway, Minnesota, and by the Minnesota Department of Health. So we're really excited about that. And Blue Cross Blue Shield um, of Minnesota have all supported these efforts as potential solutions to this issue. Great examples. And again, if anyone else has any examples that they want to share in chat, we'd love to hear them. Um, Tamara brought up, and I, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tamara, 
um, about, we'd ask what other ways people might be celebrating um, the non-tobacco um, use or non-commercial tobacco use. And um, it, it is um, a, a great point about um, needing parental permission when you're working with counseling teenagers. So if, um, mm -hmm. Chris, I don't know if you have any examples of maybe some celebratory ways that that could be done um, for teenagers where, you know, it's, it's more of a confidentiality issue. And again, Tamara, if I'm speaking to the wrong issue, then correct me, but I thought that it's not from your ch um, chat, but maybe that's what you were speaking to. Or, uh, Chris, yeah, uh, any examples yeah. maybe that you've heard of that can be used in that situation? No, but we we do know that that peer support is tr or um, peer pressure is strong, and so if we could get it more from a positive angle of again promoting traditional use and rejecting that tr um, harmful use, um, if we could get more teens to be able to do that, that would be great. I would love to hear more examples of that. And then as far as parental permission. Um, for counseling, it would be great to hear how um, other clinic partners are dealing with that. That's not something that um, I I have experience with. So it's an important thing because kids get addicted quickly, and needing some kind of counseling or support is an important part of that process. As I said, I agree. It looks like you're trying to tackle that situation. And, um, with the, you know, I cut it off before they become adults. It's probably a, a great example of one way of tackling the tobacco issue or the commercial tobacco mm -hmm. issue. Um, well, mm -hmm. just heard from Randy that um, parental permission is not needed for private counseling for those under 18, and that's in Minnesota. And I know we have um, more than just minutes on the phone, but that's great to know. Thank you, Randy. Um, I just want to check again once again to make sure um, we don't have anyone who's trying to call in with a question. No, ma'am, I have no audio questions at this time. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Michelle. And um, if there aren't, I'm not seeing any other questions in chat. Um, so with, if there's not any other questions from anyone, I think we can wrap it up, give you back about five minutes of your day. Um, do you want to thank everyone again for attending today's webinar? Um, the recording should be available in about one week on the Lake Superior Quinn website, and we just put that um, the link in the chat. Um, also, I want to thank our speaker again, Chris. Great job. We really do appreciate it. Um, if anyone has any other questions, Chris's email is there, but you can also um, send the information to our Lake Superior Fund website, um, and we can use their help answer those questions or also get that information to Chris. So, again, thank you, everyone, um, for attending today, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.